Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm excited to be here uh, and and take you through this 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 session. Um, a lot of it that stems from from uh, when you think of from elementary, middle to high school, and and thinking about whether you're a student, thinking about whether you're uh, in a coaching role, an administrator role, of how important it is to to really think about how we are getting students or others to really make this invisible thinking visible, and whether that's through their oral and or their uh, written expression. And so, so I'm going to take you through a number of, of different things here in terms of, of experiences and hope that maybe you'll uh, be willing to, to participate in this. Uh, you can do this through chat, through experiences. But, but one thing I'm going to, I'm going to really, uh, I'll start off by, by having you really kind of think about how you're going throughout this session to make your own invisible thinking visible. And so that requires in many times for us to write things down and then to and then to express them in in different ways. So uh, so let's jump right in here then so I can share a bit in terms of our working agenda for our time together. One is is this will be to to learn about these different evidence-based uh, disciplinary literacy routines and activities can be implemented in any secondary classroom. However, I'm going to stress here that these are routines that could be used in with many different individuals. I think principals could use many of these in faculty meetings. I think district level staff could use many of these when they're working with uh, 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 teachers, administrators during during training sessions. Uh, the second part is understanding how how data can be collected here and then used to differentiate instruction and intervention. So through that, making invisible thinking visible. And then, and then thinking about how some of these routines and practices really might give voice to individuals uh, and, and that agency that we often want individuals to have. This was uh, when submitting the proposal, thinking of how, how the different standards that, that we're able to connect with here, that one about identifying, explain how environmental, cultural, and social factors contribute to literacy development. And so I think that you'll see throughout this of how this could allow for so much of the opportunities here for, for individuals to express themselves. But also the second part here about the listening and reading comprehension, because much of what I'm going to do in this example that I'll provide is through the use of a poem and more about this listening comprehension. And when we think about listening comprehension uh, on what's called a phonological awareness continuum, like in an elementary school, this would be one of the, this would be one of the lowest foundational skills, listening comprehension. And much of what we do when we think about the listening comprehension part is, is all auditory. So we have to take in and listen, and then we'll think through some of the, the comprehension continuum as we go. So here's a framework that, that we're, we'll be exploring as we, as we go here. <clears throat> Part of my 30-year profession in, in education has, has been, um, a couple of the years, have been with the, the West Ed Group and Westhead is based in San Francisco. This is about metacognitive conversation. This is not program products, materials, none of that. This is all about our thinking and all about our thinking and then communicating this. So you see here uh, the central part, metacognitive conversation. So how we make our thinking, our invisible thinking visible. You see these four overlapping dimensions as well. Uh, social, personal, knowledge building, and, and cognitive. And as we go throughout our presentation, I'd really encourage you to kind of think about the different ways that maybe these dimensions could be, could be uh, really targeted, really could be thought about. Social dimension, to give just give you a general idea, social dimension of of within a classroom, within a meeting, whomever we're working with, when we think about is it safe? 
And for most individuals, including on what we would call levels of listening, safety is first. When you think of Maslow's hierarchy, safety is there. This is about, yeah, the social dimension being and working with others, that there is a safe space where I'm, I'm encouraged to take risk and I won't be judged. Uh, uh, we presume good intentions uh, on the part of others because they bring their, their own knowledge and experiences to, to whatever text we might be engaged with. In the social dimension also, this is about not one person dominating and talking through every aspect of, of how to understand a text. Yes, there is the explicit aspect of, of teaching skills. There's also this sharing, sharing our text talk. How are we allowing for individuals to really share and express their own ways of understanding understanding text and what i do might be different than what emily does might be different what karen does and all of these how it might be so helpful for someone else to understand that when i notice what someone else does to make sense of 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 text complex text and i'm not just talking words on a page i'm talking about quadratic formula. I'm talking about an image that might be posted in social studies. Uh, all these different ways that these can be text. So that's about safety. So working agreements, how do we come up and, and create these, these together? Uh, working agreements like, like a working norm, I guess, if you, if you wanted to say. Uh, personal dimension is really understanding who we are as individuals. And so you think about your own reader identity. When you get into a text, whether that be a book, a poem, uh, this quadratic formula, uh, what are you doing? What are the moves that you're making? Where do you start? And then what do you do? And what do you do if you come across something that's really complex and you're not sure what to do? Do you, do you write questions? Do you write connections within the text? Or do you follow some formula that someone says, this is how you must annotate a text. You must do this first and then this second, and then you continue down this, this kind of uh, on a formulaic way, which is mm, not always the best thing that we're looking for in terms of, of that formulaic approach. So, so that is a, a, a routine that we'll talk about, which is called talk to the text. And this talk to the text allows you to, to express and experience this in your own in your own way. So personal dimension, when we allow for others to be able to really think through and to and to be able to process information and to make their own connections here as well, we're allowing them in many ways to really think and become more confident in some of the, the ways that they encounter text. Knowledge building is we we can start thinking in knowledge building some about within our own systems in, in some cases. So if you were to think about knowledge building in a way of when we in a secondary classroom, how much could be an elementary, do we have ways at the very bottom there about building knowledge of disciplinary discourse practices? Do we have ways that we approach texts that Why? everyone Here? follows uh, more of a, of a routine throughout the system? Something like how how we write a summary, let's say, in a in a classroom. Do we do the same thing in terms of how we ask students to write a summary in English language arts? English language arts and reading, and then math, and then science, and then social studies. Do we all have a common approach here across across subject disciplines, or is it left to whomever wants and however someone teaches this? So the knowledge building is thinking about one, the scheme in the background knowledge that individuals bring to a text as we're working through this, the content of being able to connect this to real, real world situations. But it's also about how I'm making these connections and what systems might be in place to utilize things across disciplines. And then we have the cognitive dimension. And cognitive dimension is, is how, we, how we think about um, the explicit instruction things. When you think about Anita Archer's explicit instruction elements, let's say, uh, one of those is, 
at the very beginning, we think about identifying critical content. And then we think about sequencing skills, how we scaffold to sequence skills sequentially. Uh, all of these are meant to be, when we think of, of breaking things down into manageable chunks. Identifying critical content, when we think of this, is that it's not about content coverage. How many standards can we get through in any given year? That's just trying to fill heads with something that someone else might, might want to just get through. Uh, Tuesday, we got to be on this standard, and Wednesday on this, and Thursday on this. That's just a content coverage approach versus if we think about breaking things down because we've identified these, these big kind of big rocks, uh, like college and career readiness standard and reading might be some examples and pulling those apart, but but breaking things down into manageable chunks. And so so we'll we'll look at that and experience that too with with this poem that I'm going to introduce introduce to you. Uh, in the cognitive dimension though, we're also thinking about not only the identifying critical content, thinking about how we sequence skills, so I'm also thinking that at times when we think about reading text, we're we're trying to problem solve in many ways. So we have our explicit teaching and instruction. There's also times that that we are problem solving. We are using different approaches to try to really uncover and understand the meaning behind maybe a word, a phrase, uh, et cetera. So one experience here that that we won't, we, I'll give you just a minute here to kind of think about this, but one experience that we introduce when we think about this through the um, social dimension is, is getting a real sense or at the personal dimension even of, of a sense that when, when I feel safe and I feel open and I can really introduce myself and share some of the experiences. Uh, this is one that I always find very interesting, not only on the part of students, but with teachers and principals and other people at district level at district level. And the question is, how have your experiences shaped your reader identity? Now, depending upon the audience, I've changed this out at times because it might be leader identity, it might be learner identity, but, but really interesting process here. When you think about how have your own experiences over the course of your life shaped your identity? And so thinking that I could possibly know with 25 students, let's say, sitting in front of me, that I know what they do and how they do things is nearly, nearly impossible. Uh, so I might approach things from, oh, what, what I do, how I learned best, what I think is best. Uh, I could look out at the classroom and look at 25 faces and say, yep, all engaged. A principal could step in the classroom and say, yep, looks like everybody's on task. And it's like, uh, because somebody's working on something or it's quiet, that doesn't mean engaged. It doesn't mean on task. So what's really in people's heads that are getting out? And then we're orally expressing this. We really get some sense here. So in this experience, taking these, your experiences. So think from, from early on in your childhood to where you are now. I mean, for me, that's almost thinking about 53 years of my, of my life. And if I think through this, I would say some real positive, some real positive experiences that have shaped my reader identity. Uh, I often always go to my Uncle John. My Uncle John, who always had books, it seemed like in every room in their house. I swear, I always thought, how does he go from one book to another book? But in the kitchen, in the living room, uh, you could be upstairs at their house. But all these different books that he's always in, it was modeling how important it is like, to read and reading for enjoyment. Uh, reader identity, when I started my PhD program, and my PhD program, Dr. Ann Brooks, Ann Brooks was was someone who, the texts that she would bring, they were always so relevant. Um, if a lot of inquiry, but how we would, and how she would break these, these complex texts down to allow for, some, to allow you to, to really challenge your own personal, 
personal assumptions, your own internal thinking, but relevant text that you could you could really get behind and think about. I mean, so those are two positives here for me that I could be thinking about, but there are many others. Uh, a negative experience. Well, some might say at one point in time, I probably really did think about this as a negative experience. When I think about what has shaped my reader identity, uh, I mean, where I, I grew up, I mean, I had a father with an eighth grade education, a mom who went to high school. I would really consider both of them as non-readers. Neither one of them right now, uh, even at their age, would they like to read, never did like to read. And so we didn't have many books in the house. I don't ever remember having a book read to me. Uh, yet there was still something instilled in me about the importance of, of reading that here I am today doing what I'm doing what I'm doing. So so something along the way, but that could maybe be seen as a as a negative experience or a negative experience that I think definitely did not help to shape any of my identity. I grew up in a rural Iowa rural Iowa community and I had a science teacher. Her name was Linda. Uh, I won't give out the last but I'll say Linda, Linda M. <laughs> she, I unfortunately had her for seventh grade science, eighth grade science, and ninth grade science. And why this never could have shaped anything for me was because you walked into her classroom, the lights went down, you sat at a table, you opened your notebook, and she sat on a stool next to the overhead projector and copied the notes she had in her notebook onto the overhead projector. And then we sat there in the dark and copied what she had. And that was three years of not getting into any kind of text. It was three years of just copying stuff down. The procedural part of this that had nothing to do with, with shaping this identity and, and think of the negative consequences that could come. So you could do really a very similar, a very similar thing, allowing yourself to think about this positive, negative experiences, your own personal experiences that shaped your identity and and based on those, think about how this could be used with others. Because the next question that I would then pose to you, the next question would be, once you have things written down on your list, to then consider how, if at all, are your experiences evident in your daily work? Because that would be really interested. Like, I would never... Uh, I don't think, and then here I am talking and you're probably taking notes maybe, uh, but turn the lights out and let me sit in front of the overhead projector and you to just sit there and take take notes three straight years. Uh, uh, but the experience is here of thinking that, is it evident Are my own negative experiences? Do I do some of that stuff? Gosh, I sure hope not. Uh, so I think about my own feelings, but but something that I will tell you that 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 when you do something like this, you start to open up individuals to really be able to express themselves, creating some of this safe space for people and allowing them to start to really think about maybe on that positive column or maybe the things from the negative that could be positive. Uh, of how over time this could really help to increase your own confidence in, in your reading. The same could be true when we think about reader identity is that this isn't just in, like I said, in English language arts. Think about your own, all of your experience shape your reader identity in mathematics. When you're reading, when you're reading some kind of a word problem and you're stuck because there's something in there that you don't understand or you're looking at this equation or, or algorithm and you see fractions or decimals or that square root and you start to get really anxious, like just like, oh God, I don't like fractions. And so 
Uh, but if somebody knew, if this was the invisible was out and written somewhere, that the real opportunity is for someone to be able to look at this and understand why you might really struggle in some of these areas. Uh, taking a, uh, it could be a political cartoon, it could be a map, who knows, but allowing for, after explicitly teaching something about it, to imagine then the opportunities for students to, as we say, talk to the text, like have a conversation, write down on paper what you're doing. Do you go to text features? Do you go to text structures? Do you look for vocabulary? Do write questions, write connections, write your own wonderings. Uh, and that's really different, like I said, of following a formula of, of uh, annotation. So, so it's not it's not synonymous here, but here's a, so wanted to put this up here because what a great opportunity to be able to to engage, to really be able to engage others and start to create this. Uh, so the second question for this is that then what do you really know then about your students reader identities? What do you really know about all those students who sit in front of you about their identities? So be a great thing to do. You could do it certainly more than once because over the course of the year, you start to see what's what might be changing. Um, and an experience here that I thought we could take so that you as well could, could engage with this is that one thing about um, uh, the some of the work, some of the work that I still do is is with the University of Texas at Austin and the College of Education. So the Meadows Center for Preventing Educational Risk. And part of the, part of the work there at the Meadows Center is what you see on the left-hand side, you see this, uh, it's part of a 10 key series. And this one is all about vocabulary. But the 10 key series, it's all based on the science. What do we know from evidence? What do we know from strong evidence uh, of different practices that we might consider. I use these often in, in sustained professional learning opportunities, even at times when it's just I get a day of professional development or those Institute of Education Science documents because they provide the evidence and the science behind some of these practices. This is the one, and that's where that QR code should take you. The QR code, uh, you, if you search, did a search though, 10 key series, there's also um, the strong evidence in these practices for uh, elementary reading, secondary reading, elementary math, secondary math, uh, writing. There's some multiple things in there to be able to, uh, to look at. Uh, and on the right-hand side, this came from a Susan Hall, Dr. Susan Hall. She was president at one point of the, and the, the, the original, I think, of 95% group. She spoke with us in some of our schools at, at, uh, at the University of Texas as part of a project. And this was one of the things that she, she brought forth was this continuum. And I thought for, for this, when we think of, of secondary students often, of teachers in secondary classrooms, regardless of subject area, how many people were really able to get that deep pedagogy, that deep pedagogical knowledge of, of a comprehension continuum of these practices and vocabulary, general academic vocabulary, not content specific in areas, but thought that, you know, thinking through some of this as an example, that comprehension at times, if we were to just zone in and say, yep, our kids always struggle with, with inferring. So we just needed more, more, um, more opportunities for students to make inferences. We're just gonna keep on with making inferences. It's like, well, yes, making inferences is an important skill. There are a lot of other skills though that, that need to be put, put in place here. And that starts with, in this continuum, making connections. So helping students to really think about how they build background, th their own background knowledge, that schema 
in that knowledge building dimension that students bring, that vocabulary that students may or may not bring. But I wanna also say that you know, vocabulary here in thinking about this is that even though this is at the lowest level of what would be known as a comprehension continuum on the right, and then that left piece about vocabulary, what you would also find in the vocabulary practices document is, is a good deal about morphemes. So when we think about how do we help students with the prefixes and suffixes, the, uh, the base or the root words, how do we help individual students really think about these general academic vocabulary words in a meaningful, meaningful way? So that's not to say that I just teach my, my, science, my science terms. So yeah, of course, it's, it's important to understand igneous rock in a content area, but there's little chance that, that Karen and, and Anna, Emily and I are gonna have a debrief in which igneous rock somehow, somehow becomes part of our conversation, highly unlikely. And so general academic vocabulary, words like analyze, a word maybe like describe, uh, just some of these, some of these words that could be used in any subject area. They're considered as these high utility words. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Beck, uh, <laughs> like lost, lost my thing there. Uh, talk, Dr. Rita Bean, sorry, talks about some too, about, about, uh, about vocabulary, the Bean, uh, Beck McEwen and their uh, Bringing Words to Life book as well, talking about uh, tier two words, that's not intervention, that's those general academic vocabulary words that are so important. Because take a word like analyze, and if you were able, able to play on this and use that as a morpheme activity to understand the parts, you could also really use some of that vocabulary to help students then think about the, as we change, as we change and add prefixes or suffixes, change parts of speech, you know, we can go from analyze to analyze to analyzing, analysis, analytics, analyzation. There's a whole list of other words in that word family that we could introduce students to. And then you start to think of, wow, instead of just honing in on a content specific term, these other words and the words within their word families, if I really took time to go and start looking at, at test items, I'm gonna find a lot of these words embedded in, in high stake test items or even benchmark, whatever it might be. ACT, SATs, that they're not all content specific. So really honing in and thinking about the choosing of some of these. So I thought we would take this from the from the right hand side here, and then to think about through think about this through through this experience. Um, so when we think about this this continuum, <clears throat> I chose um, this is a uh, a Common Core College and Career Readiness. Uh, standard, anchor standard. And if you read that on the left-hand side, I'd like to know who in this, of these 156 people in this session this morning, who has the answer? What does this standard really mean? There's a lot in it a lot of skills in it. And if you if you wanted to to look here at Web Align, that's Norman Webb's um, uh, Norman Webb and his work at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, Web Align is they provide these different um, tools to help really think through and break down and understand the different depth of knowledge levels. Uh, that's not the wheel that people sometimes see. That's not this table that people try to put together to show how blooms and, and depth of knowledge work. Uh, Norm, because of the work that I've done with him and his team, would put big X's over all of that and say, that is not from us. Uh, so the depth of knowledge levels that you really can start to pull apart because this has different key aspects. 
how do we interpret words and phrases? Uh, what do you really know even about technical, connotative, figurative meaning? What are, what are the meanings of, of each of those? What, what are they? And then the examples, technical, it's just right there. It's literal, uh, what I say. Connotative, can you really understand the implied feelings or, or opinions of, of, of something that you're reading or someone you're listening to? What about those figurative meanings like similes and metaphors? One, identifying it in the text, but two, what does it really mean? And then the last part you see at the end of this, that conjunction uh, and all of this stuff and analyze how specific language traits have shaped meaning, mode, or tone of the text. Well, maybe I could work through and I could do all that for someone, uh, but that's not the that's not the point of the standard. It's can kids, can students do do all of this stuff? So, so I chose this um, here on the right hand side, this poem. This poem is called Old Man by, by Ricardo Sanchez. Uh, there are, if you were to do this search, I see in this in this particular poem, this word shepherd that they've spelled S-H-E-P-H-A-R-D. Uh, but I'm only used to the E-R-D. And if you do a search, you'll see that there are multiple ways of a really thinking and spelling. But I've had people get so caught up on that spelling on the one slide that I have that then they miss the whole the whole poem. And so, so don't get yourself caught up on uh, on just just that. So, so I'm going to start here, and I'm going to read. I'm going to read this poem. But what I want you to be doing, if you see on this right hand side, this comprehension continuum. I want you to be thinking about, is there anything that's happening as I read this that's helping to, to build your own background knowledge? Is there anything that's helping to, to consider what vocabulary might mean? Uh, I'm gonna ask you to, to think about questioning. Not only like, am I asking questions, but as reading this poem, what are the questions going on in your head? And write them down. So uh, if you see things or you're hearing things that are connecting to background knowledge, write it down. If there are questions that you have about this poem, now that you're listening to it, write it down. Are there predictions that you can make as I'm reading certain things? Mm, write it down. Are you visualizing? Is there any other imagery that's coming to your mind as I read? So write it down. So all of these meant to not just sit and listen, but be processing and try to get some of your thoughts down on paper. It's fine if the first time through you just want to just listen and close your eyes and just take this in uh, and then write, that's fine. Because there are a couple of other ways that we can look at the same poem and through repeated readings, we continue to get deeper in terms of the, the content and what we can do with this. So, so here we go with this, with this poem. Old man with brown skin, talking of past when being shepherd, the one on the left there, sheep herder, in Utah, Nevada, Colorado, and New Mexico. Can you imagine being a sheep herder in that kind of topography? Uh, was life lived freely? Old man, grandfather, wise with time, running rivulets on face, rivulets, R-I-V, that first, that first root in that, almost like a small stream that you can see on face. Deep, rich furrows, a furrow like a trench. So think about on these, on the face that the deep trenches, almost like looking like little streams. Each one of these is a legacy, deep, rich memories of his life. You are Indio, among other things. He would tell me during nights spent so long ago amidst familial gatherings in Albuquerque. Old man, loved and respected, 
he would speak sometimes of pueblos, San Juan, Santa Clara, and even Santo Domingo. And his family, he would say, came from there. Think of those pueblos, thinking about this community, sometimes built of cement or rocks, even seashells. And his family came from there. Some of our blood was here, he would say, before the coming of Coronado, the coming of Coronado, this Spanish invasion, forcing people to, uh, to um, convert to Christianity, uh, the stealing of, of goods, the overtaking of, of communities. But some of, our, some of our blood was here, you would say, before the coming of Coronado. Other of our blood came with Los Españoles, and the mixture was rich, though often painful. So talking about other of our blood coming from this Spanish invasion. Old man who knew earth by its awesome aromas. Think of aromas as this pleasant flower, a smell. If you like coffee, we want your smell. Uh, and who felt the heated sweetness of chili verde by his supple touch. Gone into dust is your body with that stoic look and resolution. But your reality, old man, lives on in a mind soul touched by you, old man. So if you were to think about that, take just, I'm going to give you about one minute here to write down. Did, did you notice any of these skills? So if you could write down for me, uh, take about one minute. Is there any background knowledge that was built for you? If so, what and how? What about vocabulary? Were you asking any questions? If so, uh, write them down. Were you predicting or imaging, making images? Were you inferring, determining importance, synthesizing? So let me give you one minute here. And on your paper, uh, write down any responses to, to those. If you don't mind, and if you're willing to, if anyone wants to, um, uh, if anyone wants to chime in here and say what they were, any part that they were thinking, or go to chat and then chat, type. Were you doing anything with background knowledge? Any way that that was happening? Did you have questions? If so, type type your question. So let me just give you a moment to see if anyone is willing to, to go into chat there and to type out. We do have a response for visualizing. Mm, great. Rich images of the Southwest, oh yeah. Pueblos were bringing up rich and yeah, okay, you can see mm -hmm. that. It's great. Making connections to my grandfather. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, think of how important this is. I could be doing the same thing as a teacher through my own read alouds of, of a text. What's all coming to mind? And I'll let you keep keep going, uh, keep typing in here. Of yeah, here's love and admiration. Yeah, I was even if missing. 
Okay, yeah, that's good. Making connections, great. Yep, so, so yeah, keep adding because this isn't about we're gonna get all these skills taught uh, quickly. It's gonna take some real, it's gonna take some real time. And so how we could do this so frequently, but each time trying to get students and others to write down what's happening and imagine the richness that comes. And in a session that I, that I did with a group of teachers, we paused for a minute to see what were the questions, not that I was asking, but what were the questions that you were asking yourself throughout the reading of this poem? And we started to make a list of all these questions. And it was like, now, isn't that fascinating? All these questions that just now we listed out, it all came from you. Think of as through a unit or whatever it is, a lesson, all the things that we could now be responding to because we've gotten kids or others, we've gotten their thinking out on paper. We have things that are visible. So, so in this, as that is an example, that is a first, a first read. Now, I could say that we're going to do this a second time, a second read. The second read might be, um, I want you to, to listen for what it makes you think about. So are there things you wonder about? What about questions? That might be a second read. So first read might be just the first time through. And maybe it's just about feelings and emotions. Maybe the second read, it's all about this, the connections. But maybe then if I do a third read, what if in the third read, I then said, this is going to be what you write about. What was the author's purpose? Was there a message or a theme here? What about a word choice? Did you find anything in here that was really powerful, uh, kind of really speaking to you? So, so just really thinking about if I want students to just listen, great, that's fine, just listen. But repeated readings over time, and you think about how each time I could dive deep in, deeper. Notice I didn't do all the annotations and the thinking for you. Uh, this is about trying to generate, trying to generate this. But the more it's read, the more opportunities here to really continue to increase the depth that we have with, with this poem. So great activity exercise to be able to, to do here as you, as you work through, as you work through this. Now, also imagine that if we left some of these open and we went back to that framework at the beginning of how we might be able to then think about the, how we might be able to then think about uh, just the, the, uh, the social dimensions, creating safety uh, for individuals. We might be able to think about how we're sharing text talk. Uh, also that those personal connections that we as individuals are, are making. So a lot of different ways to be able to really think through. And then maybe we, we wrap this up by thinking about the, the skills, skills that maybe well, we are assessing on that comprehension continuum. But hey, that's a, that's a really great way to just get some general, some general sense. Now, the other thing of thinking about how when we use something like this, like a poem, the other thing about this is how if we got you to put things on paper, just see and imagine how some of this could be used to, to really consider or the questions that we wrote up, uh, ways to extend or deepen learning, those questions that might allow for a lot of additional research that we can move on. We might find that some some students, we might not need to do a little more scaffolding. And so well, what could that look like? So if you looked on, uh, if you look at that poem, I put here as an example that 
hey, maybe during tier one instruction with my sophomores, let's say, uh, tier one with my sophomores, that we, I did my, my own read aloud. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about this as I go. And I'm marking things up as I go, a question that I'm asking, a connection I'm making. Uh, maybe I'm writing down, oh, here's a vocabulary word in here like rivulet. And I could divide rivulet into, into uh, syllables, R-I-V, U-L-E-T. It's plural with the S on the end, rivulets. I talk about each of those parts, rib, yeah, that little stream that we see, but no, we notice in the picture, there are multiple. But if I were teaching an intervention group, I might have some students who, they don't know syllables. They've never been introduced to syllables, uh, the different syllable types and what and how we can use syllables to really help to understand and, and gather more meaning. So R-I-V, closed syllable, uh, that B that closes in the I, and the U is a standalone, it's an open syllable. It says the long vowel sound, the L-E-T, uh, that vowel closed in by, by consonant. So it's a closed uh, short vowel sound. But there are many people in that I know of in my experiences nationally and internationally of working with teachers that that wasn't part of my, my programming. Well, that's okay. I mean, we can think about though that, that learning that we can keep coming back to. So, so I might take this one poem. If I were an English teacher or a social studies teacher and decided to use something like this, this poem, I tell you, I would use it over and over and over again as a great mentor text potentially. Because I don't need to start and teach skills cold all the time with a new text. I have a a text here that could be used in many different ways. I have this text that could also be used by someone who might provide an intervention uh, for students. I don't need to give them a new text. I don't need to put them onto a different program. I don't need a new teacher uh, using something different. Let's connect what it is we're doing, how much easier it might be for our strugglers, struggling students, our struggling readers to really have this opportunity to make these connections of what they're doing in the classroom. So, so I might choose here in, in some of these that I said about the uh, using this poem during a, a tier one read aloud, tier two intervention group, hey, maybe we only use the first two stanzas and it's about practice more about the fluency, or maybe I'm trying to reinforce certain skills. But in a tier three, tier three intervention group that maybe I only use the first stanza. And in that first stanza, I wanna just target and practice morphemes with those with those students. So a lot of ways to, to think through, to think through this. One other thing that I did uh, put in here that, that I thought would be could be really interesting here too for for all of you in uh, who are teaching in a secondary classroom or if you are in a role of like an administrator or whomever you know it's always important to lead by your own models and examples uh, you create these conditions for learning to to take place but I put this uh, QR code. Um, and it should take you to it should take you to an article called "The Power of Collective Efficacy." Uh, is that true? Yes. Uh, so it should take you to to this article. And what I was thinking here is that is to to be able to think about a couple of other um, a couple other routines. They're not called a strategy that I'm implementing. Uh, these are routines that might take a little while to really introduce to students, and it becomes more of a habit. We're using it frequently. We're trying to take kids back to that social dimension where they feel safe. They're hearing what other people have to say. They're writing down what they're thinking about, but they're also developing their own, continuing their confidence because of how they are interacting with text. Uh, there's also this piece of how do we do this stuff 
across across subject departments, talking to the text, golden line, capturing the reading process, uh, a, a double entry metacognitive log. Do we have routines that we can all use throughout our system and not every time I go to a different class, oh, it's somebody's somebody else's uh, idea, how they how they teach. But think of the patterns and the routines that might be really helpful here. So so for example, let's take let's take this article of the power of collective efficacy and we'll just use just use a little bit of this um, to think about uh, the very first one, talk talk to the text. Talk to the text, you could do, boy, you could do a whole lot. And if I gave you just one, one minute here to, to look at the first, what well, you could start wherever you wanted. That's part of the whole thing. Some people might start with just the, this front, just this front visual and talk to the text. If I use just this very front page, talk to the text, I would be marking all over that front page with questions and connections and wonderings. Or for some people, I just start to look through, I wanna see how long this thing's gonna be. So that's, that's what I do first. For some people, maybe I'm looking at, at all the text features like why are some why is some of the print the font larger than others? Why are some things in italics? What do these colors have to do with this? So some people might might do that. Others might just dive right into the text in the 1970s. So let me give you a minute, just so we can we can think about this. Just about a minute, and start wherever you want, but mark it up. That's the important piece about talking to the text. You need to get what's in your head on paper. It's like you're having a conversation back and forth. So take about a minute and write down all the things that you're all the things that you're doing. Oh. Anybody, anybody willing to uh, share something? You can come off mute if you want, or you can go to chat and uh, type here to just be able to say, uh, what's something maybe that you, that you marked, something you were thinking, a question. Anybody want to come off mute or... Um, or type in chat what you were thinking? So I'll just share here. Oops. I didn't even get into the to the words this time. I started and just stayed right here on this front page, this picture. Because because as I look at this picture, I'm starting to to wonder uh, what what are all these what are all the colors here? Like are they meant to are they me meant to represent? floors or levels or I don't I don't know what they what they mean uh, I see this what looks like a cloud so I'm thinking mm, low clouds or 
whether this thing is really built pretty high. I'm thinking of how this represents or reminds me of, of maybe in Egypt and the building of, of the pyramids. It did, was it one stone at a time? I don't know if that's something I would want to learn more about, but is this really, is this something that they, that they did? Like one piece at a, at a time? Did it have to be handed? Uh, I also see multiple people working together. So it's not just one person doing all of this work. And so then I might have to think about on the next page, the power of collective efficacy. Is that really what this is meaning? That the power of collective efficacy, collective, many, many individuals. But I could continue my work throughout this whole piece and thinking about this one piece of text. Now, I would never be thinking about, we're going to, we're going to go through this whole text in one day. Absolutely not. That's like this quick, let's just get through this thing. Uh, an article like this that could be used for days and think of how many of these skills would I be covering? I would be a deep dive into vocabulary. I have a real potential here to be thinking about not only vocabulary, but maybe some of the morphological structures of language. I might be able to really think about, oh, those questions that we generate together that might lead to more opportunities for research or extended learning. I might just with one paragraph be able to make uh, a hunch or a guess, some kind of prediction. But I am not thinking about rushing through something just to say, I got through it, yep, and now we should start something tomorrow. Uh, so this could be, in my viewpoint, wow, the opportunity. A, a, pro a, a project like this or an article like this that's used in, in mathematics, think about the same thing in terms of there must have been a lot of different calculations of now I'm posing these questions about the Egyptians and what they did and how they did it. And can you imagine moving some of these stones and boulders up up to create this uh, these pyramids? It's just it's like fascinating to me of what could all be done if, if I slowed things down and it wasn't about, let's see how fast I can get to this. So talking to the text, it might be that, hey, for uh, for one of our days, maybe that's that's all we do. We spend however much time uh, in small chunks, not read for the next 15 minutes, no, uh, maybe five minutes and we'll see where we get and then we'll pause. But the cognitive dimension, we think back to that framework, it's let's not see how fast we can go. Let's break these things down into manageable, chunks because every part of this text even if that's all we did today think of all of the knowledge that could be could be gleaned from just this one thing you get your invisible thoughts on paper it's not what i think here but these invisible thoughts i could pick them up I could, I could then if I pick them up from students, I could get a really good sense of who marked what. Maybe some people have nothing written. Well, that says that says something, something too. But I might only do uh, that first paragraph in the text the next day. But even that, we don't have to read that whole thing all at one time. That could be read the first three lines, read the first five lines, whatever it might be, but slowing things down. The golden line is after we've, we've had an opportunity to read a certain amount of text, the golden line routine is that then you choose, you choose one sentence, one line that really stands out to you. It's something that you find to be extremely important in this text. And it doesn't matter if we pick the same thing. So someone would say, oh, you took mine. And it's like, no, I didn't take yours. You picked it for a different reason. And what was your reason for choosing that line? 
So if you were to think about gold online and I were to tell you that uh, always important to have people take others to the text, pause, let them get there, and then to read it. So if I were to share, if I were to, to think through this, I might say, I want you to go to turn to page 43. On page 43, I'm in the middle column below that figure one. And I, in that middle column, I'm about halfway down. And it starts with the sentence. It start the sentence starts with teachers need to. And I might pause for a minute. Everybody gets to that, that part, that line. And I'm gonna read it. Teachers need to see how collecting evidence fits into their daily routines, how they can use daily evidence to determine impact and how they can make adjustments to their classroom practices when results aren't demonstrating increases in student outcomes. I choose that, I chose that because I think it's really important to be thinking about if we're gonna really try to do this metacognitive conversation and get this invisible thinking out and on paper, what I can do, what I can do with that. I don't wanna wait until the end of a lesson to say, here's an exit ticket. And then I say, oh, a lot of kids didn't get it. Well, an exit ticket is, is not the solution. It all the checkpoints throughout the lesson that with that immediate feedback, my exit tickets should should look pretty good. But if I wait until the very end and then say, here's an exit ticket, I mean, that's just like waiting for 45 minutes to pass and hope that what I did uh, was effective. This, even as talking to the text of this golden line, I get some real opportunities to allow kids to be making their thinking visible, getting things on paper throughout the entire lesson. Imagine how powerful that is, but it has to be taught explicitly and has to become a routine. Routine, again, any of these could be used in any subject area. And I always really stress for principals and others in the central office type roles, you should be modeling these routines as well. You have such power and capacity to model this with teachers uh, frequently. What a great way to think about a school-wide professional learning community. And this is what we do. We don't come together every week to just look at more data uh, and to say, ooh, what, who's not making progress? Because maybe I don't know how to change things. So just continuing to look at more numbers and more data uh, isn't always the answer. So use every bit of a time for learning. The third thing here that I typed was about capturing the reading process. And so this is um, always interesting too for a routine because whether it's, um, it doesn't, this doesn't really matter what, what subject area you are in as well. Let's say you took something, students were reading this informational content in science, or they were reading something in a culinary textbook for a CTE. Capturing the reading process is meant to, to try to understand what you're doing as you move through, as you move through text. Do you, do you reread? Do you stop to paraphrase? Do you stop to write a summary? Do you stop to ask more questions? I mean, what are you doing as you're interacting with the text? Do you look to see if this is uh, asking you for a problem solution, like text structure or cause effect? But capturing the reading process then, uh, we write those all down. Like what are the different students or different individuals? What are you doing as you read this text? I just flip to the back and read the, read the last paragraph, or I mean, all of those are, that's capturing someone's reading process. So what do we do? And it's not always the same for informational text versus narrative type text versus poetry, drama. When we think about reading a mathematical word problem, these aren't always the same in terms of what students do. And then the, the last thing here that I put here is about a double entry metacognitive log. And the double entry metacognitive log is really meant 
to think about uh, two things. Uh, so you have your, your double column. On one column, you're writing down the evidence that you're finding in the text. So certain things that you might be, be reading for as you're going. And you're defending this with, with evidence in one column. But the other, the other column is meant for your interpretations, potentially. Like, oh, based on this evidence, something that I found here, I now am thinking in this other column, maybe about other wonderings, maybe about other questions, maybe about the connections. So it becomes more like these, these in, the evidence that I'm finding and then my own internal uh, interpretations that I that I'm making with the the text. So stressing here that as Louise Motes said in 2020, uh, reading is not simply a desire; it is a fundamental skill necessary for virtually everything we do. And we need to ensure all of us, particularly our children, learn to read and read to learn, so they too can do everything. The power getting what's in your head on paper to be able to really monitor and to think about what kids are doing. These are a few things and it's in the handout there that, hey, maybe maybe you decide that uh, hmm, after leaving this session, here's some things maybe that I wanna, I wanna test out or maybe I wanna seek out more information about some of these routines. Like how does this stuff even, even work? And so, uh, what did I learn about some of the, the different routines? Maybe I choose one and I actually use it. Maybe I find an article and I plan for, for this in the future. Uh, I think about the routines and how they might benefit diverse learners. Think of our English learners versus our gifted and talented versus our inclusion students. How do different routines work with different groups of students? If you implemented one of these routines, what might you really learn about certain struggles? And that becomes some really good opportunities then to think about the small group or the intervention. But again, it doesn't have to be more text. It doesn't have to be when I go from tier one to tier two or if I am tier three, aligning. Dr. Sharon Vaughn talked about that uh, last week during a lunch and lit presentation. Why do we continue to ask students who are struggling to engage with multiple programs, multiple resources, uh, different individuals, why do we not align this, this work, this instruction for our students? It seems like it should be a common, common sense. Uh, another question might be after implementing one or more of the routines or activities, you know, yeah, then what did, what did you learn? But make it as a routine. Can't be a one, a one and done. Uh, so uh, here is my, uh, my contact information, my, my email address. If you're, if you're a Twitter user, I can't do that. X. That just doesn't work for me. So the, the Twitter, Twitter users out there, feel free to, to connect, uh, connect with me in social media. But, you know, thank you so much for, for joining this, this presentation. And I'll, I'll pause there and stop and, and uh, turn it back over to Karen and, and Emily.